Ah, welcome to the last video in this series on Europe. This one is about the economic geography of Europe. There's lots of stuff to learn about this. The natural resources in Europe have basically pushed it into being one of the most productive areas of the world, along with that Industrial Revolution thing. So Europe has many different kinds. For instance, the Northern European Plain that we learned about in the first video has this uh, fertile soil called Chernozem, and this land is good for farming. And it's this wind-blown soil. It's like black. You'll see some of that. Um, the, the Ruhr and Po valleys have deposits of iron ore and coal, which led to a lot of industrial production. Uh, some parts of Europe still have forests, like Norway and Sweden, and they produce timber there. There are large deposits of oil on the floor of the North Sea, which is great as an energy resource for Europe. And then mountainous areas have mineral resources. Here you can see, over here in Norway, um, the green area, those are all forested regions where you can actually harvest those forests. Um, you can see some pasture land down there, um, and then some hardwood harvesting as well. Um, but Norway is one of those unique places that still has forest resources in Europe, because most of the forests were all cut down. The Ruhr and Po valleys, um, the Ruhr valley is in, is in Germany, in a border area um, between Germany and France, and the Po valley is located in northern Italy, and these areas had a lot of coal and iron ore. Um, as a result, after the Industrial Revolution, these areas have high concentrations of industry because it, coal and iron are really heavy, so you don't want to ship them somewhere to do something with them. You want to put your industry right nearby and then cheaply transport those goods and then uh, take the stuff that you make and send that further away. Here you can see the Ruhr Valley. And see how large, this is the pie chart of the major industries, and you can see that this area, this is a huge pie chart representing that there's way more industry right here in the Ruhr, um, but also the Saar and this area, this entire region really, um, is highly developed in terms of industry. And you can see iron and steel being the major things in there, and, and that has to do with the, the natural resources that are present. And here in the Po River Valley in northern Italy, which we saw in the physical geography video, um, you can see there's a lot of mechanical work that's done here, and that is part of the history of the development of Italy. Uh, but they have a lot of industry because they had a lot of materials. In the mountain regions like Switzerland and Andorra, uh, they rely on tourism and recreation, but also the mineral resources. So it's unique. You get like skiing and beautiful places to stay, and then also you extract everything from the ground. Um, Switzerland also relies on international banking because of its history as a neutral country at various points. In Europe, agriculture is really highly developed. So they're a highly developed place economically and their agriculture is crazy because they use these advanced farming techniques which result in high crop yields and because of that fertile soil they also end up with a lot of food and a lot of other products that they make by farming. Crop yield is a measure of how much food can be grown per square mile or hectare. Um, crop yields are higher in Europe because they have chemical fertilizers which help add nutrients back to the soil that the plants need to grow. You have tractors and machines which help you harvest with fewer people a larger area and often more efficiently. Um, and they also have genetically enhanced plants which are so cool and we'll talk about in class because I'd studied that in college a bunch. Um, polders are another way that Europe has found to get more land, even more land to farm. And this they're mostly in the Netherlands and Belgium. And they're called the low countries, Netherlands and Belgium, because they're low in elevation, really close to sea level. And they're small, and they don't have a lot of land for farming, historically. So they've made their own land to farm on, because polders are areas of land reclaimed from the sea. Now, developed or developing? This is the question. Are European countries developed or developing? It's actually a pretty easy answer for all of Europe, because they are all considered developed because they have a high per capita GDP. Everyone earns enough money to get a high standard of living. So then there's high life expectancy because of access to medical technology and uh, food and nutrition. There's low population growth rate because people aren't having as many children because there's low infant mortality. So you don't need a lot of children to end up with some surviving. And there's a low percentage of the population under age 15 because people live longer and there's low growth rate and also really high literacy which those are all signs, those are the things we say, oh, you're a developed country. And here you can see Europe on the map of developed um, versus developing, and you know Canada, the United States, very developed, Europe, very developed, and, and that's, see, it's Western Europe, though, because we kind of leave out these Eastern European countries, which are less developed, but they are at least primarily developed. The infrastructure here, uh, the countries in Europe have 
really well developed infrastructures and that's part of being a developed country um, the channel uh, which is a tunnel that actually goes through you know under the sea floor of the English Channel which we looked at in a previous video uh, connects Britain and France rivers are connected with canals from the long history of connecting uh, rivers up with these man-made rivers and it provides really cheap transportation they have a very good rail system and a huge percentage of internet connections and cell phone use there are three kinds of economic systems uh, which Europe has seen the free market economy which is based on the idea of supply and demand and that individuals should own things in the economy there's a mixed economy where governments own important industries or especially provide social safety nets and there's a command economy where governments own everything are in charge of everything and direct everything after World War II ended in 1945 the Soviet Union controlled the majority of Eastern Europe and forced those countries to be communist and have a command economy in 1990 though those countries regained independence when the Soviet Union fell so Eastern Europe is not as well developed as Western Europe because it was communist and that system turned out to not work so good the factories are obsolete and heavy industry in those areas cause serious pollution which harms farming uh, but an example of mixed economies Denmark and Sweden uh, it's kind of nice they have really good health care which is paid for by the government and they can retire early um, and their unemployment is low and they have like pretty good societies and then Denmark and Sweden unfortunately rank number one and two in terms of how much taxes the people pay uh, because the income tax is around 42 to 63 percent but again they're using those taxes to pay for things that everybody needs it's really complicated and cool and lovely and you'll learn more about that if you take my economics class the European Union is the dominant economic force in Europe right now and basically the European Union put in place this single currency which means that all those countries you can just trade on the same money and it makes things a lot easier um, and it also makes it a little bit easier to control the ups and downs of that currency it's called the euro and they use it to promote and facilitate trade and these are all the countries who are currently part of the European Union and they added a lot in 2002 through 2004 and there's another slot a whole bunch of countries that have been uh, wrangling to get in including uh, Turkey which is isn't even technically in Europe for the most of it but there's some problems Several areas in Europe are facing severe pollution problems, like the Black Forest uh, suffers from acid rain, although much less now. We've actually done a lot about that. In Venice, there's serious water pollution because it's a city on the water, and uh, there's not a lot of places to put your uh, refuse and trash. Uh, the Rhine, Danube, and Seine rivers all struggle with water pollution. Here you can see this is a, a major area that has been affected by uh, the acid rain. This is in Germany. And here's what it looks like when you have acid rain. It basically strips the trees bare of their leaves and they kind of collapse in on themselves. And it's really sad and destroys forests and ruins habitats and ruins soil. Because here's how it works. Pollutants from factories and stuff react with molecules in the air of water and they rise and condense and become clouds that aren't totally water-based. They also have this acid stuff in it because these plants, especially like power plants, um, and factories emit CO2 and SO2 um, and lots of other noxious chemicals and those hit the clouds condense and then fall as acid rain compounds and they fall down to the surface of the ocean and the land and rivers and lakes and they kill the woods and they get in the water and it harms the things that live in the water it's basically just a rough time for everybody around and we'll look at some of these videos in class but basically what you need to know is that as Europe became more industrially developed they then also had to struggle with the effects of pollution. But that is all for this video.